Today's SCHS WAP lecture is on the Industrial Revolution, not since our very first lecture. Uh, about the agricultural or Neolithic Revolution, have we had such a huge topic come up? The Industrial Revolution is going to dramatically alter the way people live their lives um, and how goods are produced, what people's life expectancy is, what people's quality of life is. Um, there are going to be epic changes in regards to how work is done and where people live, and all of those things will be affected by the Industrial Revolution. Um, everybody should have a set of guided notes, and I want to draw your attention to the primary source investigation at the very end of it. Um, we've got two different sources, and I've asked you the main points of each author. Um, pretty much they're diametrically opposed to one another. The third question asks you to sort of analyze what that means and how we can sort of hold both of those primary sources in our minds at the same time while gaining information from them, given the fact that they are so different from, from one another. So please make sure that that portion is completed when you come into class. It is a part of this set of guided notes and needs to be finished uh, just like the blanks. We're going to be talking about, of course, the Industrial Revolution today. And um, the first thing that we need to do is really understand what the Industrial Revolution was before we go on and talk about any of the effects um, or reasons that it began. So the Industrial Revolution, definitely a big deal. The first thing that you need to understand about the Industrial Revolution is that it is a huge change in the availability of energy and a movement from renewable sources of energy, for example, wood, um, wind, to non-renewable sources of energy, which we today call usually fossil fuels. I'd like you to double underline that word fossil fuels, the fossil fuels um, which um, were created millions of years ago through the breakdown of organic plant and animal materials uh, and um, putting those materials under pressure over time resulted in things like coal and oil. The Industrial Revolution will first hinge on the burning of coal and then uh, later on on the burning of oil. Um, and I guess today we see a movement back toward some uh, renewable resources, but still the primary um, uh, generator of the energy uh, throughout the globe today is fossil fuels. And um, fossil fuels are interesting because they serve as a really compact um, mass of energy. And I hope you guys understand that all energy uh, on which our planet is running is uh, derived from the sun in some way, shape, or form. Uh, the sun's um, energy uh, allows um, plant life to flour flourish, and therefore uh, animals that eat those plants and animals that eat those animals sort of uh, have their genesis in the energy from the sun. Fossil fuels are the same way. It's just organic matter that has been broken down and then uh, under intense pressure sort of um, created into compact sources of energy. And what happens is that uh, people begin to experience a crisis in renewable energy. Uh, Strayer talked about this pretty extensively in the chapter that um, you should have just completed. Um, there was not enough wood anymore. Um, the population had grown and there was a crisis of energy. There was not enough um, charcoal to smelt iron ore etc. So what you got was um, a really big problem in terms of uh, where energy would come from and humans began looking for other sources of energy and they turn first to coal and um, not only are they going to be burning different types of materials in order to release that energy from them, they're also going to be using that energy in a brand new way uh, through mechanical devices. And those devices are going to be a huge supplement to human labor. Uh, we rely on them to a massive extent today. Uh, humans and animals are not able to work constantly, but a machine, if it is given enough fuel, is able to work uh, day in and day out, uh, night in and night out. The steam engine will be the first mechanical device that's going to be used to supplement human labor. And um, James Watt, will be the inventor of the steam engine. I think uh, 1769 is the date, but I'd like you to regardless write his name out to the side of the steam engine, James Watt, W-A-T-T, -T, and I hope that you see in his last name uh, the genesis of uh, our term for uh, measuring energy. 
So um, after a while, uh, internal combustions will be invented, but that won't be uh, for about 100 years after the invention of the steam engine. And putting a steam engine onto a mechanical device allows you to uh, conduct production in a brand new way. Um, and it also tends to pull production toward one center. So rather than having small workshops spread out over disparate areas, what you get instead is uh, a revolution in the methods of production. And we'll talk more about those later, but uh, for the purposes of uh, this introduction, what this really means is gathering all of your workers together into one location, which will be called a factory. Factories really did not exist before the Industrial Revolution on any uh, great scale. Um, and um, industrializing the production, uh, how one uses energy, what one uses energy to um, run, and how that energy and how those machines are used and gathered into factories is really going to form the basis of the Industrial Revolution. We want to talk about life before the Industrial Revolution. This says life in Europe before the Industrial Revolution, but really this is life everywhere before the Industrial Revolution. Primarily, and you guys are aware of this, uh, people live on um, subsistence-based farms out in rural areas. I'd like you to jot the figure 90% out to the side of this bullet point. About 90% of human populations uh, lived in rural areas and uh, usually conducted subsistence farming. Subsistence farming, please remember, is um, farming that supplies just enough uh, energy or calories to fulfill the needs of um, that family unit that's doing the farming. So there isn't really a lot left over, um, perhaps enough or hopefully enough for planting and to pay taxes. Uh, and to feed the family. There's going to be a huge uh, change as industrial production methods are um, utilized on the farm and this is going to free up an awful lot of labor uh, to go to the cities and work in these new factories. Life before um, the Industrial Revolution was also based around, and this is true for um, Europe, based around public lands which were called commons. And pretty much all villages were set up with uh, houses and outlying fields. And then sort of in the center of the village uh, would be a set of land that every villager was allowed by law to graze their animals on. And this provided the difference between um, starvation and uh, subsistence for people. If they lost these common lands uh, where their animals could graze, they would not really be able to make ends meet in a very literal way. Um, they would not be able to produce enough calories to allow themselves to continue for another year. And I don't mean really that they're going to be eating all of the animals that are grazing on those commons. What they're going to be doing is um, a lot of times using those animals to help them do the labor that will produce the calories in terms of grain that they'll be then eating. So this is a really, really basic lifestyle that we're looking at. There was a very small upper class, a very large lower class, and a small number of people in the middle. And this is pretty much true uh, across the globe, not just in Europe before the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution will give rise to uh, people like you and me, uh, the middle class. And life expectancy is extremely short. Uh, child mortality was very, very high. Uh, and there are periodic famines that sweep through all countries uh, universally. And without modern transportation mechanisms, for example, trains, getting grain from one localized area that has a surplus to another localized area, which is experiencing a famine, was impossible. Um, so what you had is a lot of localized uh, famines that occurred on really, really regular basis um, throughout the globe before the advent of the Industrial Revolution. Again, life is marked by difficult labor, um, strong difference between social classes, uh, and a subsistence level of life that's um, very difficult and marked by um, short lives, mostly driven through um, a high rate of death for children. So um, we often view life before the Industrial Revolution in terms of sort of this lovely bucolic uh, vision. And that's a good uh, ACT or SAT word right there, bucolic. It just means uh, very pastoral, um, attractive, rural, 
uh, non-industrialized setting. And here we see a very famous painting from England called the Hay Wayne. Uh, it was produced actually during the midst of the Industrial Revolution. It has that sort of uh, backward gaze at the time period before the Industrial Revolution as something um, idyllic and beautiful um, that could be looked back to. And although in some ways, um, rural life, uh, you can see where people were going in terms of that idealism and um, envisioning it as a beautiful, uh, you know, non-mechanized, slower way of life. In a lot of ways, uh, again, that life before the Industrial Revolution was very, very difficult for almost all people. The revolution um, of industry is going to actually begin in England right around 1750. Um, and again, it's driven by a crisis in energy resources. There are not enough trees uh, to burn as wood or to create into charcoal to burn uh, hotter. And this is going to drive the um, people of England to seek out other um, sources of um, energy. The agricultural revolution is another huge driver of the industrial revolution because it pushes population higher, which increases the pressure on traditional sources of energy, um, which in turn, of course, causes the deforestation, which causes humans to look for other sources of energy like coal. The agricultural revolution is uh, driven by the scientific revolution that we looked at earlier, that idea that um, the natural world can be explained and understood and perhaps uh, harnessed for um, bettering circumstances through the use of reason and the scientific method. Um, because of the changes that were going on in agriculture, um, for example, the introduction of the seed drill, um, if you went out to the side of that second bullet point, the agricultural revolution, please note the seed drill. Um, it's a huge invention. Um, instead of scattering seeds across a field and hoping that some of them take root, there was a machine that would um, sort of dig the little hole and drop the seed in it one by one. It really increased um, the yields that were able to be um, achieved in uh, all of these rural areas uh, by a lot. Um, that's just one example. There's also uh, livestock breeding programs that take off. And um, a big one is um, the sort of reclamation of lands um, to be used as uh, arable land or farmable land um, through draining, through uh, drainage. And the Netherlands sort of um, pioneers that move since it is uh, at such low sea level. And then those uh, ideas uh, driven by wind power sort of spread into England, you get a lot more farmable land. So of course what happens as a result of all that is that the population increases. The other huge deal is the enclosure movement. As the population increases and as agricultural products become more valuable, food is needed more. And the common lands that used to just be sort of used by everyone to graze their cattle on are suddenly in high uh, demand as a place to instead grow crops on for sale to this burgeoning population in England. So, um, at the same time that the population is increasing, um, the need for agricultural workers is actually decreasing because of things like the seed drill. So there is not a lot of work that can be had and people can't make ends meet without common lands. So what they end up doing is moving into cities where they become cheap labor for these new factories that are going to take off soon after the agricultural revolution uh, causes that bump in population. These are all examples, of course, of enclosed fields. And uh, anytime you fly over a place like England today, uh, you'll see it. It did not used to look like this with all these little hedgerows and fences around the fields. It used to be a lot more open. OK, the revolution begins for um, a series of reasons, of course. Uh, first, population growth, which, as I mentioned already, puts a huge stress on natural resources uh, and traditional sources of energy. There's also a movement in England toward uh, laissez-faire economic policies, and this makes it uh, lucrative for, uh, for example, large landowners to enclose their, their land. Remember, laissez-faire means when the government sort of takes a hands-off policy toward uh, economics. That's a very, very important phrase. If that is uh, still unfamiliar to you, go ahead and maybe triple star it and write again 
that this is when the government takes a hands-off attitude toward the economy. The British government, um, in many ways, in their domestic policy, sort of took their hands off of these issues. So, for example, rights that people had enshrined in law to common land began to be overturned as um, that idea of laissez-faire government policies toward economics took hold. And that allowed large landowners to continue that process of sort of moving uh, villagers off the land, enclosing the land in fields and selling those uh, products at a higher price. There is also um, joint stock companies, and this is a huge deal as well. We've talked about um, both the VOC and the uh, British EIC, and those uh, are just two examples of um, this sort of dynamic and um, dynamic view of economics and that movement toward um, extensive trade. So there's lots of money to be made. And um, with that money, you get um, investment and surplus money or capital that's able to be invested in what will come later, those factories. Of course, hopefully we remember the caravel. And of course, you definitely want some fish and chips to help boost your population. Okay, the revolution also begins for um, a for other reasons. Uh, we already talked about the scientific revolution. Um, the scientific revolution not only drives innovations like the seed drill and uh, livestock breeding programs, it also drives the movement toward new technologies. And that scientific method combined with the huge need for new energy sources and uh, the mechanization of labor um, pushes various people, especially James Watt, to create um, new technologies that take advantage of these new sources of power that are starting to be utilized because of that great need. Um, in addition, England had a lot of really strong natural resources. They had a lot of uh, flowing rivers um, to run water mills and a lot of coal and iron close to the surface and close to already established population centers. And that is a huge deal. So I'd like you to put a little star beside coal and iron. We're going to be talking about that um, in just a little bit. Okay, the Industrial Revolution um, is, again, driven by the desire for new sources of energy because of need. Uh, the population through the enclosure movement, through the Second Agricultural Revolution, was growing and they needed new sources of power. So they looked to coal first. And uh, interestingly, the steam engine gets invented because uh, they're looking to um, create a way to pump water out of mines so that they can get more coal. Coal is being used for traditional purposes and in traditional ways, just simply burning it um, rather than harnessing um, that heat energy to boil water and move mechanized parts. So the steam engine is actually first used, uh, ironically, to get more coal out of the ground to use for traditional purposes. And what people found is that once that steam engine got invented and perfected by James Watt, uh, you could apply it to a zillion other uh, different kinds of uh, uses. And so you start to see the mechanization of uh, other areas. So not just water pumps to get more coal, but you saw that utilized as uh, steam engines to run, for example, textile mills. All of this will drive these production changes. The first is the introduction of mass production, which is making lots and lots of identical stuff. And a hallmark of modern human life is our stuff. Um, we are a hugely uh, disposable society today. And um, a lot of that comes from the ease of making stuff. Uh, for example, um, Kleenex, right? Kleenex, uh, you gotta blow your nose, you grab like three tissues, you blow your nose, you're done with it. Um, in the past, if you needed something to blow your nose on, you would need to grow cotton, which could only be done in tropical areas. You would need to spin that cotton into thread. You would need to weave that cotton into fabric. You would need to create that fabric into a handkerchief and you would need to carry it with you wherever you went uh, and wash it when it got disgusting. That is a huge amount of effort. And uh, without modern industrial production, uh, that's pretty much the way that um, things were produced. And mass production completely alters uh, people's relationship with things and how things are utilized. Um, 
A extremely important component of mass production are interchangeable parts. These are exact copies of various parts of tools or objects. They are not individually crafted. The first place where this actually uh, happens is in um, gun manufacturing. Um, it used to be that uh, it was very difficult to produce uh, the various components needed in guns and when one part wore out and needed to be replaced a uh, handcrafted uh, object would need to be made to act as that replacement part with the advent of interchangeable parts which are um, of course exact copies created by machines you get a lot uh, easier production which of course feeds into that idea of mass production the division of labor is um, hugely important for factories. So now that we have interchangeable parts that are going to be used in mass production, you can gather a lot of workers together, not in like a small workshop where there's journeymen and apprentices and master uh, craftsmen. What you do is bring everybody together and they don't need to be high skilled anymore. They could be low skilled workers and they would complete repetitive tasks in factories. Um, that is the division of labor, dividing up all the various um, components of creating an object like uh, a rifle and having each person complete one repetitive task, usually with the aid of a machine. Um, let's see. Mechanization. Mechanization, of course, is having machines do what used to be done by hand, and those bulky machines meant that... Um, all those workers would need to be moved into factories. I'd like you to put perhaps a big llama beside production changes. Each of these words I've bolded because every single one of these words needs to be remembered and understood by you. If you need to make um, flashcards for it, do. Um, however, I think that you probably have heard of these words even if you've never really thought through the actual meaning of them. All right, let's talk about the location of coal mines um, as I said before, um, the location of coal is going to be critical to the advent of the Industrial Revolution. And without um, coal that was very close to those uh, population centers where, um, where the energy was needed, it would not have been looked to as a resource because it simply would not have been able to be transported. So when people sort of think about um, economics in the 1700s, right, uh, China is by most measures uh, far ahead of England in terms of productivity and uh, acting as a producer of products for the world market. However, um, China does not make that leap from a charcoal and wood to coal. They don't make that leap to the steam engine because the coal mines were really far from their cities. So imagine that you've got about you know a thousand miles between um, the centers where stuff was being produced and the sources of coal. So uh, there just wasn't that, it, it wasn't sensible really to turn to coal or to turn to steam engines because there was no way to transport that coal over the huge distances between the coal and the centers of production. It just did not make sense to move the coal over those distances. Um, you might say, well, why didn't they just like invent the train and um, make the coal move across the earth based on a train? Well, to have a train, you've got to have a steam engine and to have a steam engine you kind of need an impetus to change your, um, uh, to change the way that you burn that object and to change the actual source of the fuel. And there really just were not those um, uh, push factors present in China at the time. There are a lot of problems associated with early industrialization. First, cities are gonna grow in England at an insane rate. And again, the government was fully focused on having a laissez-faire attitude or a hands-off attitude. So there are not really regulations or um, safety measures or even sanitation systems put into place by the governments. Um, instead, you just had sort of uncontrolled random growth. And you can imagine um, moving from, you know, uh, a few thousand people to 100 or 200 or 300 or 400,000 people in a very short period of time is going to result in just horrendous living conditions. You also had very low wages, which were driven by the fact that factories, mass production, and the division of labor uh, caused there to be not as much need for skilled workers. And hopefully we understand that unskilled labor usually makes a lower salary 
than skilled labor. So um, wages were very low and living in those cities on those low wages sort of exacerbated the problems uh, present in those urban areas. There was also a huge amount of child labor that was occurring. Um, we have reports, literal reports, uh, in the primary sources from England of children working in coal mines as early as the age of four or five because they were very small and could sort of uh, get into the mines uh, quite easily. They also, as they moved into the textile industry, uh, which was driven by those same steam engines, uh, children's fingers were small, nimble, and could uh, sort of tie up threads and work uh, in those close confines of those early factories and machines pretty easily. So child labor uh, is um, really what the Industrial Revolution in England was built on. And children, of course, at the time could be paid lower wages. Uh, there were no minimum wages set by the government and no oversight uh, that said child labor uh, could not be done below a certain age or for more than a certain number of hours. And again, this was because of laissez-faire policy. So I'd like you to jot that word again out to the side of where it says, why not? If you've forgotten how to spell laissez-faire, go back and check it out in the notes. Again, all of this drives really squalid, nasty, dirty conditions, which led to a lot of disease. And in addition to all this, workers were unable to combine their forces together to form labor unions. Of course, one worker on their own doesn't have a lot of power when placed up against the owner of a factory, but a lot of workers who are working in collaboration with each other have the opportunity to sort of uh, balance out that imbalance of power um, that they have vis-a-vis uh, -vis the um, factory owners. However, labor unions were um, not only discouraged, they were illegal. Uh, Anti-combination acts were passed in pretty much all countries that began industrializing exactly to prevent the workers from uh, attempting to uh, create better conditions or higher wages. And last but not least, we had crazy business cycles. These were swings of growth, depression, and recovery. And without the intervention of the government, um, like we had in our recent um, own economic recession in the US in uh, 2008, uh, we of course had huge amounts of government intervention during that uh, economic crisis back in the day when real laissez-faire policies were in place, those kinds of interventions were not possible. And so the sort of highs and lows of the business cycle were much more intense than they are today. This is an example of what I was talking about in terms of city growth. This is Manchester in 1750, and this is Manchester in 1850. You can see uh, the gray are areas of development. And you can see there's the bend in the river. So the city used to be just that little area right there. You also see the advent of canals and railroads, which is a really cool thing um, that allow materials to be transported into cities. Um, cities that are more than a million people in the ancient period were not physically possible. It was not possible to move enough food into the city on a daily basis to really allow populations of more than one million to subsist. After the Industrial Revolution occurs, for the first time you'll see cities grow above that sort of cap of one million uh, that was reached by cities uh, in both China uh, during the Han and uh, Tang and Song period, uh, as well as uh, in Japan um, and um, the Roman Empire earlier in European history. All right, there are some benefits despite all this crappiness that goes down. Um, this, I suppose, is not a benefit for everybody but Europe, but Europe was pretty excited about it. They had always, again, been sort of a crappy peninsula hanging off the side of the Eurasian continent. All of a sudden, through the harnessing of these huge amounts of um, power through fossil fuels and mechanization, they're able to grow more dominant globally. They won't be just shipping goods around, they'll actually be producing the goods that drive the global economy and becoming very wealthy as a result. Uh, the middle class has a huge standard of living increase throughout this period, and slowly that standard of living increase will catch up with the lower classes as well as uh, labor unions are legalized, wages rise, and uh, factory conditions improve, uh, and um, laws are put in place to ban things like um, child labor and um, things like the weekend are created um, and uh, the eight-hour workday, for example. Uh, so 
throughout uh, Europe at least and areas that also industrialize. Not only does the middle class experience a standard of living increase, eventually after about 1850 we start to see those gains uh, reach the lower classes as well. The production of goods goes up, people have access to great stuff. Um, you guys know how much I love my um, water boiler, um, my access to uh, tea, my little Starbucks cup that I drink it in every day. All that kind of stuff was produced uh, by, of, and for the Industrial Revolution. And um, of course, lots of us are grateful to have things like vehicles that you know drive us around so that we don't have to walk everywhere. We don't have to live our lives within that sort of classic uh, six mile radius that was uh, common and uh, the reality for people before the advent of the Industrial Revolution uh, in, in about 1800. Travel, communication, production, all those things are revolutionized. And the life that we are leading today and the um, reality that my voice is coming to you across uh, crazy communication lines through a series of ones and zeros and electrical impulses uh, is made possible through the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Re Revolution will definitely spread because uh, it's a good idea overall. Um, it's going to first spread across Northern Europe, areas like the Netherlands and Belgium will industrialize first, and then uh, Germany will become the uh, sort of premier industrial country um, in Europe uh, after 1870. Uh, Germany becomes a nation in 1870, and its industrialization had already taken off, and it will take off even more after, uh, after it becomes a nation state. Uh, former European settler colonies, and that term we've already talked about, um, but I wanted to reiterate it, and I'll do that again um, as we reach um, other chapters in time period five. Settler colonies are areas where uh, Europeans uh, have gone to settle and set up colonies. So they're not places that Europeans just go and control. They're places where Europeans went and settled. So um, an example of a former European settler colony is the United States, and by 1850, um, perhaps even a little bit before that, the U.S. is uh, under full-fledged industrialization, at least across the northern states. Russia and Japan, after uh, 1880, maybe a little bit before for Japan, will also begin uh, industrializing and um, will both become uh, world powers through that industrialization process. Also, early industrialization, this is a very important point, I want you to llama it. Early industrialization is pushed by market Forces. So I want you to write out to the side of market forces. I want you to write that it happens naturally because of need. It happened naturally because of need. Market forces. It happened naturally because of need. Britain had the agricultural revolution. Population went up. They didn't have access to enough uh, natural resources to be burned as fuel, so they started to look for other kinds of fuel, namely coal. They found that the uh, coal that they wanted to burn was uh, difficult to get out of their mines because of all the flooding of the water, so James Watt uh, perfected the steam engine and pushed that water out of the mines. Somebody realized I could use a steam engine not just to uh, pump water out of mines, but also to run uh, textile mills and thus the indu Industrial Revolution is born sort of naturally. Later nations are pushed to industrialize by their national governments. Pretty much what people realize and what governments especially realize is that England's power is going to experience like an exponential increase after 1750 when their Industrial Revolution really begins to um, occur. And other national governments see that as a huge advantage. So for example, in the United States, uh, rail railroads weren't just built by magic because some entrepreneur wanted a railroad. Railroads were purposefully promoted and in many ways paid for by the federal government because it was understood that that would allow them to grow in national power. The same is true of Japan, especially uh, when Japan's uh, Tokugawa shogunate is overthrown um, in the uh, 1860s, uh, the government will realize that it is going to be in trouble if, uh, as a nation state if they don't industrialize. And so there was a very top-down approach. So what I'd like you to write out to the side of where it says pushed to industrialize by their national governments, I'd like you to write top-down. All right, 
The spread continues the second industrial revolution, which is a vocabulary word, after uh, 1870, so it kind of takes over from that steam power, uh, the internal combustion engine, which uh, runs on uh, oil, gets invented, and uh, things like electricity and chemicals, and eventually plastics, will become important industries. And this had a number of results for non-industrialized areas. Industrial economies have a massive, massive desire for raw materials. Factories, as we've already said, could run day and night, um, churning out more goods, and they needed natural resources badly to keep that new economic style moving. So they're going to go out and they're going to, through the use of uh, mechanized power, colonize less productive, aka non-industrialized empires and governments. We will see this happen across Afro-Eurasia, uh, in this time period. Um, even such um, superpowers as China will experience a huge uh, change of place during this period and their natural resources um, and uh, a desire for trade will be exploited by Europeans after the Opium Wars. And if you guys will remember the McCartney mission, we uh, acted out that playing class, the McCartney mission goes down in 1792. Britain came pretty much uh, on bended knee, asking China to agree to trade. China said no. Uh, the 1830s and 1840s are the um, years when the Opium Wars took place, when Britain used mechanized warships to uh, steam, literally steam power up rivers in China and bombard, using modern artillery, various Chinese cities into submission. So that colonization is going to be fueled by that desire for raw materials. Uh, in China, of course, it was tea. Um, there's also a move toward raw material production by other economies. So we see this happen in Latin America. I spoke about it in our last lecture. Places like uh, Egypt, um, the uh, Ottoman Empire, will also um, be moving toward raw production materials. And they don't have a lot of uh, desire or impetus to move toward mechanization themselves because uh, they're making a lot of money selling out those raw materials. However, long term, I hope that you guys understand not industrializing is a huge disadvantage because an industrialized power uh, is able to move into your country at will and um, subdue you. Uh, mass production of weapons, uh, the use of steam power and later internal combustion engines to uh, exert power on a global scale and um, create uh, hegemony for, uh, for a country's self is hugely um, hugely advantaged by uh, the presence of industrialization and it's not possible without industrialization so not industrializing while it might make you money in the short term through the selling of raw materials to those industrialized countries is a bad idea long term overall we'll see new global relationships we see raw materials exported from agrarian economies to industrial economies And we see, at first, textile exports from industrial to agrarian economies. Of course, manufactured goods are more expensive than raw materials. So um, it is better to be the industrialized power exporting um, manufactured goods. The last thing I'd like you to jot, um, I'm sorry, I should have put this earlier, on your notes, um, way up here, where you've got, let's see, production changes. I'd like you to just add where it says mechanization, will you add out to the side first in textile mills? First in textile mills, that's an important fact that we need to know. I know it seems a little bit arbitrary and silly, but we need to know what gets mechanized first, and that's the manufacturing of textiles fabrics. All right, if you have questions, please bring them to class, and I will see you tomorrow.